you will start to hear people using almost the same language. This divides people into upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. I've had a lot of people ask me about how to screen for obligers because they only want to hire obligers. Oh. There's sort of this idea that there's one right way. There's no magic, one-size-fits-all solution. Do you want to be able to support others? Freedom, security, radical changes at any time. Think about what you want. What am I interested in that everyone else in the world is interested in? And I thought, well, power, money, fame, sex. And I just started doing all this research. To me, they felt very connected, like they were, it was like a set. And finally, I was like, this is the kind of research a person would do if they were going to write a book. And I thought, well, maybe I could write that book. Hi, and welcome to the Erica Taught Me podcast, where we learn something new each week to better position ourselves for success. I'm your host, Erica Kohlberg, and I'm a lawyer and money expert. Today, my guest is Gretchen Rubin, who is a five-time New York Times bestselling author, podcaster, and one of the most influential voices on the subject of happiness. In today's episode, we're going to tackle the changes you can implement to become happier and how the four tendencies can help you to learn more about yourself. I'm Erica Kohlberg. This is Erica Taught Me, and today we're here with Gretchen Rubin. I've been so excited to ask you, what is it that people get wrong when it comes to happiness? So there's one thing that I think people really mess up. And because there's sort of this idea that there's one right way, that if, if you could just find the right guru or download the right PDF from the internet, it would tell you the right way or the best way or like the one thing you have to do to be happy. But the fact is there's no magic one size fits all solution. We each have to do it in a way that's right for us. And so I think often people get discouraged or frustrated with themselves because something doesn't work for them or somebody keeps trying to get them to do something that doesn't feel right. And instead of saying like, well, it works for you, but it doesn't work for me, they feel like something's wrong with them. Or like I used to be, you can get kind of judgmental because you're like, well, it worked so well for me. It should work so well for you. I mean, instead of realizing, well, some people are morning people. Some people are night people. Some people are marathoners. Like they like to have a lot of time before a deadline. Some people are sprinters. They like to work intensely right up against a deadline. There's no right way or wrong way. It's just whatever works for us. And I think people skip that. That makes sense that there is no universal solution. But do you think there are a few things that people are overlooking that could be simple changes they could make in their lives that could make them happier? Well, if you had to say just like a few things that are pretty universal, one is relationships. To be happy, we need strong, intimate relationships. We need to be able to confide. We have to feel like we can get support and just as important for happiness, give support. So anytime you're thinking about doing something that will deepen your relationships or broaden your relationships is probably going to make you happier. So if you're thinking about like how to spend your time, energy or money, like should I go out with my coworkers after work? Should I take a minute to talk to a coworker about their weekend? Should I go out of my way to go to that party? Should I go visit my friend's new baby? Anything like that is probably going to make you happier. And then another thing is, and this is so obvious, is like you got to think about your body because your physical experience is always going to color your emotional experience. So things like getting enough sleep, getting some exercise, even something like a 20 minute walk a day is enough to like boost your happiness, your energy, your immune function, like give you a lot of benefits, even discomfort. Like if you're really uncomfortable, like there's too much light shining in your face when you're sitting at your desk or you work like this with your shoulders up, that can like these little changes in your physical comfort and energy can also make a big difference. And that that's true for just about everybody. I'm curious about what changes you've made in your life since authoring these books about happiness. Oh, I've made like a thousand. <laughs> it's like my, you know, it's, it's my work and it's also my hobby. So I, I do a, a million things. One of the ones that I'm doing right now is I go to the Metro Metropolitan Museum every day that it's open that I'm in New York City. Um, so that's for my five senses book. And so and this has just been this wonder, not, not everybody would be able to do something like that, but that's been a pretty big change in my schedule and has had really positive impact on my happiness and my creativity and my energy level. Um, and then I've done smaller things like now, whenever somebody comes and goes from my apartment, I give them a big hello and a big goodbye. So my, my theory is like my dog shouldn't show more enthusiasm for my family than I do. Every year I pick a one word theme for the year. This year, my word is salt. And I try to like, you know, work that into my life in a lot of different ways. So I do a, I do a lot of different things. Salt as in yeah. what you eat? 
Yes. Cause so are you consuming more sodium? <laughs> uh, well, and actually research shows that probably you can eat more. You, you don't need to cut back on your on your salt. Well, for years, my words had been pretty dry, like delegate, uh, diversify, think bigger. They were just they were sort of dry. And, and, and so I wanted something kind of more metaphorical. So I picked salt. Salt is a preservative. And I'm really into like preserving memories. It's a universal flavor enhancer. A little bit of salt makes it mitigates bitterness and makes sweet things sweeter. So it's like, that's a good metaphorical thing. It's connected to hard work. It's connected to the ocean. It's the only rock we eat. So it's kind of magical. It turns out there's all these sort of ways to think about salt that are very kind of thought provoking and, uh, and, and, and help me think about my values and what I want my, what I want my life to hold. That's so interesting. So to make it more tangible for me, because I'm a very tangible person, what is something specifically this month that you've done that goes with your salt trend? Well, just this morning, I watched a video about an expert talking about why if you put a tiny bit of salt in your coffee, it tastes better, which I was like, you know, because it mitigates bitterness. Um, so that's one thing I'm like, oh, salt, I must watch this video. <laughs> Somebody sent it to me. And they're like, I know you're interested in salt. I'm like, as a matter of fact, I am. And then like one thing I'll do too is whenever I, I read all the time and if I find a great salt quotation, I'll keep it. And it turns out there are a lot of great salt quotations. Like Carl Uwe Knausgaard wrote, um, sugar thinks only of itself. Salt helps others. Or I can't remember exactly what the quotation is, but it was interesting. So I, I look for quotations that have to do with salt too. Interesting. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast a while back that you did and at the time, you had said that for four years, you were not taking any sugar. Oh, yeah. No, now. Are I've you done, still with that? Oh, yeah. It's like more than 10 years now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't okay. Really can you explain sugar. this to the audience? Oh, my gosh. OK. Well, I can be very tiresome on this. But the short story is I was on vacation with my family. I happened to read a book by Gary Tobbs called uh, Why We Get Fat. And I was drawn to the book because my my sister, Elizabeth, who's the co-host of the Happier podcast with me, is a type one diabetic. So I really had I'd been wanting to learn more about insulin. And I knew this was a book that was really about the role of insulin in the body. And I read this book like overnight. I completely changed the way I ate. I basically gave up carbs. So sugar, flour, rice, beer, grains, starchy vegetables and fruit, most fruit. And I just stopped eating it. And it was like the greatest thing because I have a really, really, really powerful sweet tooth. And what I found is that instead of trying to resist my sweet tooth, if I just got rid of sweets altogether, and it turns out carbs often have kind of like a craving thing. Like you eat a piece of bread, you want another piece of bread. There's just something about carbs. Whereas if you're eating like an egg, it's like you don't want to eat limitless eggs. You're like, I've had two or three eggs. That's enough eggs, you know? Uh, one piece of fish. I don't need three pieces of fish. Whereas you could be like, I'll have seven pieces of pizza. I just loved eating that way. And also I used to get really, really hungry when I started eating low carb. I didn't, I, uh, hunger comes on much more slowly. I get satisfied. I stay satisfied for longer. So I really, yeah, for a long, I basically don't eat carbs or just, you know, vegetables and nuts. I do eat a lot of nuts. Wow. I was so excited to hear that because I'm actually very much an all or nothing person. See me too. I have no concept yes. of moderation. Yo. So this in better than before, I write about being an abstainer or a moderator. So abstainers are people like you and me. We can have none or we can have a lot. We can't have one cookie or half a glass yeah. of something. And moderators are people who like need to have a little bit or they want to have it sometimes. So they want to have a few French fries. And for moderators, they do do better when they have like one square of fine chocolate. But for abstainers, it's very hard. And I found that just abstaining was so much easier for me. And it's, the thing that's interesting is that people think it would be harder to give something up completely. But if you're an abstainer, it's so much easier. It's so much easier for me to have no sugar than to have a little sugar. And that's why I don't, because it's just easier for me. You should. It's, I feel so seen. <laughs> yes. Well, what is something where you feel like you're either all or nothing? It's sugar. It's, so right? I'm addicted to sugar. Yes. But I'll go through bouts of maybe one month or my longest was three months where I just say I'm abstaining from sugar. Yes. None of it. No sugar, nothing like alcohol. And I'm really good at that. Maybe yes. the first week or two is quite hard with cravings. But then after that, I yes. have no cravings. And yeah. I'm just very good. But yeah. then if I break it once, it's yeah. over. Well, that's the thing. I think that sometimes people are sort of feel like it's wrong to abstain. So they say things like you shouldn't be so rigid. Mm -hmm. You should follow the 80-20 rule. You shouldn't like treat certain foods like they're forbidden. Um, if you're too hard on yourself, you'll kind of like go like you'll go nuts and kind of go the other way. And I really don't think that's true. I think it's just 
for people who are abstainers, it's just easier. But you can have something called a planned exception. So planned exception, this is what I would say for someone like you too, where it's like, if you go off, you feel like, okay, now it's all over. A planned exception is you're like, tonight's my anniversary. I'm going to go out and have a piece of cake and a glass of wine. And it's going to be amazing. And I look forward to it. And then I have it. And then I look back on it. And I think this was great. And I had a great experience. But I didn't break my rules. I didn't, I didn't, I'm still doing exactly what I planned and I'm enjoying it, but it's a planned exception. Because what happens for a lot of people is they feel like they sort of, they feel like they've got, they've sort of lost control or they've blown it. Well, I've blown it now. Where it's like, you haven't blown it at all. This is what you planned for. And with a planned exception, you look forward to it, which is great. You're not like changing your mind at the last minute. Oh, it's on sale. And you look back on it with pleasure because you're like, I did exactly what I wanted. And it was great. And I had the like, I went to a place where I knew that they had the, the best tiramisu in all of New York City. I got exactly what I wanted because a lot of times when people break it, it's like they break it. They're like, oh, my gosh, I'm walking by this donut shop and it's three for the price of two. And they uh, how can I resist? And, uh, you know, how can I not take advantage of this? And so they don't look forward to it and they don't look and they don't look back on it with pleasure because sometimes people are like, well, I, don't, I can't give up sugar for 10 years. I don't want to live like that. It's like you don't have to. You don't have to give it up to still be an abstain to have basically the, the power of being an abstainer. That's so interesting. I also have a weird thing with these. When I abstain from something, it has to start on the first of the month. Like yes. if I need no sugar, Feels it has suspicious. to start on the first. And if I mess up, like if I mess up on the third, then oh, sorry. Yes. Wait till next month. <laughs> that's very that that's a thing a lot of people have. It's like the auspicious begin, or like if I if I blow it in the beginning of the day, the whole day is ruined. Yeah. Is the abstainer personality type related at all to the four tendencies? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I would love to have the big data and run. Yeah. Like anecdotally, not that I can tell, but so far, no, yeah, no correlation. No, no, there yeah, 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 yeah. Can we talk about the four tendencies? Yes, yes. I would love talking about the four tendencies. So take us through explaining what the four tendencies are and how you can figure out which one you are. Okay. So this is a personality framework that I stumbled on, created when I was wor working on my book Better Than Before, which was all about habit change, because I started noticing that there were these really conspicuous patterns and how people could or couldn't uh, form habits. And I got my big insight when a friend said, it's weird. I know I'm happier when I exercise. And when I was in high school, I was on the track team and I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running now? Okay, so same person, same behavior. At one point, it was effortless. Now she's struggling. So what's, you know, you could think of many kind of hypotheses, but what's what's going on? So that's what led me to the four tendencies. So this divides people into upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. And what it's looking at, and this sounds so dry, but it turns out to be really juicy, is how you deal with expectations. So we all face two kinds of expectations. Outer expectations, like a work deadline and inner expectations, like my own desire to quit sugar, my own desire to write a novel in my free time. So depending on whether you meet or resist outer and inner expectations, that's what makes you an upholder, a questioner, obliger, a rebel. So upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. So they meet the work deadline, they keep a New Year's resolution without much fuss. They want to know what other people expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. Um, so their motto is discipline is my freedom. Then questioners question all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. So they resist anything arbitrary, inefficient, unjustified. They love research. They love to customize. Um, they're making everything an inner expectation. If it makes sense to them, they'll do it no problem. If it doesn't make sense to them, they'll resist. So their motto is, if you convince me why, then I will comply. Then there are obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. So this is my friend on the track team. But she had a team and a coach expecting her to show up. She showed up, no problem. But when she was trying to go on her own, it was a struggle. So the big bottom line for obligers is they need outer accountability even to meet an inner expectation. So if you want to read more, join a book group. If you want to exercise more, take a class, work out with a trainer, raise money for a charity, take your dog for a run who's so disappointed if she doesn't get to go. You just need that outer accountability. So their motto is, you can count on me, and I'm counting on you to count on me. And then finally, rebels. Rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do. They can do anything they choose to do. 
But if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And typically they don't tell themselves what to do. Like they don't say things like, well, every Saturday I'm going to take a woodworking class because they think, well, I don't know what I'm going to want to do on Saturday. And just the idea that it's on my calendar is going to annoy me. So their motto is, you can't make me, and neither can I. <laughs> so those are the four. Could you have guessed before I told you which of the four I was that I was a rebel? I think I would have thought there was a high likelihood that you were a rebel because I know many people who have the kind have set up their kind of entrepreneurial system that you have. And I've noticed that it definitely attracts rebels and that rebels tend to do very well. So if I had to guess, I would have guessed rebel. <laughs> there was... I, I felt so seen again when I was identified clearly as a rebel by taking your quiz. And one of the funny stories I was recounting was whenever I go, whenever I used to go on diets, mm -hmm. I would actually gain weight. And so there's, <gasps> this, yeah, there's this funny like chart that I had. I was going to Hawaii for my first vacation with my now husband and I really wanted to lose weight. I had maybe 40 days out to lose weight. And so I created this big poster with every single date and I measured my weight every single day. And we we're laughing because it, it went up every single day. And it's because since I set myself on this diet, yeah. I rebelled against it yeah. and I ate more than I yes. would have normally eat. Yes. Yes. And I mean, that is something that many rebels say. And it can be really frustrating for rebels because they're like, how do I get myself to do what I want if I can't, if I can't tell myself what to do? Yeah, so I have many strategies that I now, I've talked to so many rebels about how they do it in their own rebel way. Because the fact is, rebel is an incredibly powerful tendency when you do things that are in the rebel way. And so, yeah, I got, I've got a big bag of tricks. That okay, I've please tell from me. I need, okay, okay. I need the tricks. So one of them for rebels is that identity is very, very important for them. So anytime something's tied to their identity. So if you were thinking about your identity, like, I'm a healthy eater. I like fresh, unprocessed foods. I don't want to be weighed down by like, you know, what all the big food companies are trying to, they're trying to addict me with their salt and their, you know, all their additives and their crinkly packages, but I'm not going to eat that way. So part of it is like this identity, a little bit of a, of a, of a resistance. Like I'm not doing what they're telling me to do. I'm not, I'm not a sucker for their advertising. Another thing is I tend to love a challenge. So like, Hey, my husband said that I can't give up sugar for three months, you know, without a break. We'll all show him. So sometimes that can be really fun. Sometimes gamifying it. So um, if you could think of a way like I'm going to give up all sugar, but once a day I'm going to like draw from a draw from a hat and pick one thing that I'm going to have that's going to be like the thing that I do that breaks the rules. So then it's sort of like this game. And it's also like I'm deliberately, uh, deliberately breaking it. I talked to her rebel who said she wanted to give up sugar. So every single day she would wake up and eat a piece of candy because she's like, ha ha ha. Here I am eating my candy before <laughs> breakfast. And then she's like, now I've done that. Now the rest of the day, I don't have, I've, I've proven to myself that I'm not chained by these rules. And so this one little piece of candy is all I needed to be healthy the rest of the day. And obviously like one, you know, having like one little strawberry candy. So I have talked to a lot of rebels who have found the way to do it in the way that's right for them. Because just sort of saying like, here are the rules, I'm going to follow them. That tends to be like rebels don't respond well to that. I watched a podcast interview of you a few years back where you said that most people don't change those of the, so if I'm a rebel, I yeah. was born a rebel. Yeah. I've been a rebel. Yep. But one thing I wanted to ask you is when I was working at the corporate law firm, I was the best obliger. I really was like, I would work till 4 a.m. because they told me to work till 4 a.m. So was I just concealing my rebel part during those years at the law firm? Well, it's interesting because you do see that some rebels are attracted to areas of high regulation, like the military, the clergy, the police or cor uh, like uh, corporations with a lot of regulations. Um, and so sometimes I think rebels almost take take power from that or take energy from that, like the way you push off from the side of a swimming pool. And then also maybe your identity was like, I'm just going to like blow their minds because sometimes rebels are like, you can't believe what I'm capable of. I'm going to show you. And so there's sort of this excitement even in kind of showing like how far you can go. But then at a certain point, it's kind of like, yeah, I've had my fun or I've made my point or, you know, I'm over it. I wonder if at a certain point, kind of you did it in a rebel way, but then at a certain point that it was just like, you know, or just like, why are you going to quit now? And you're like, yeah, it's not so hard to quit. <laughs> yeah.
So I also found it interesting because I, after I figured out my tendency, I went on to, I, I believe it was GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies. Everyone yes. should do that, by the way. Yeah, take the quiz. <laughs> take the quiz. I had my husband do it. Yeah. And my husband is an to obliger. A hundred percent, right? Yes. And in my analysis about rebels, it said most of the time rebels are married to obligers. Why is that? Well, um, or if, or also like work partners. Um, like if you have a founding team or like two, you know, professionals who work together, there's two reasons. One is obligers are the type O. They are the ones that match up the most easily with the other three. So they, they kind of can do well with all three. Upholders and questers can have trouble with rebels sometimes because they're, the upholders are like, we have a plan, let's stick to it. And questioners are like, I don't understand why you're changing your mind now. Or like, you need to explain everything to me. And rebels are like, I don't, like, I don't want to take the time to explain. I don't want to get caught up in that. But obligers often, because obligers feel the weight of external expectations very heavily. And the rebel is the one that's like saying... Your family is really demanding and needy, but you know what? We're just going to, we're just not going to go home for Thanksgiving. Come on, come with me. We'll escape. And the, the, the obliger is like, really? <laughs> and so they feel this tremendous relief because the rebel kind of shows them you don't, you can just ignore expectations. And for the obliger, that's really powerful because obligers feel the weight of outer expectations the most of the four tendencies because upholders have their own inner expectations to sort of as a counterbalance. Questioners are really driven by their own inner expectations. And so I think that obligers respond to the rebels and they're not as irked by the rebels as upholders and questioners are. So it kind of works on both sides. But it is definitely of all the patterns of who works well or not well with each other, the rebel with obliger is by far the most dominant pattern that I just see in the world. You know what you should do is actually go pursue a partnership with Tinder or Bumble. Because I think this could be really interesting to That's such a great make idea. it standard on yeah. your Tinder or Bumble profile to let people know which of the four tendencies yes. you are. Because I've seen, even with my past relationships as me being a rebel, yeah. when I've tried to date rebels, it does oh, not work. No. It's very I, toxic. It's very hard. Yes, yes. I should do that 100%. You should do that. There you go. <laughs> One would think you were an expert. Yes. No, that's a great idea. So what are some other pairs that work? Well, as I said, obligers are like the typo. They tend to pair up the most easily with the others. Upholders and questioners. So I'm an upholder and I'm married to a questioner. That tends to work really well because they both meet inner expectations. And so the, and they both understand how someone would need to be driven by inner expectations. And so that tends to be a very uh, a really good um, pairing. A pairing that is that tends to be very, very difficult is a rebel and upholder. Like you and I could be great friends, but we probably <laughs> wouldn't be great business partners because we just have a different way of working. Like as a as an upholder, I'm like, I like a plan, I like a schedule, I don't like spontaneity, I like things to execute as predicted, I like a lot of planning. Whereas a rebel is much more tied to like, how does this feel to me right now? I want to leave room to be spontaneous. I might make a sudden shift in priorities because all of a sudden, like I have this new vision um, and I want you to just come along with me. I don't want to have to be weighed down in like explanation and, 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 and arguments about the fact that we've had a completely different plan in place. And so people accuse upholders of being rigid and inflexible and they accuse rebels of being sort of like unpredictable and sort of, you know, kind of just like, all of a sudden just, just sort of throwing things to the side and going their own way. And so you can see how this would just be very frustrating. It's not yeah. that either way, one way is better or worse than the other. It's just they're not very compatible. They tend to just prefer to work in different ways and value different ways of working in a, in a way that makes it hard. Truthfully, if it were socially acceptable, I would like to commit to plans, all plans like two minutes before. No, like 100%. someone's like, oh, you want to go to dinner in two weeks? I would like to be like, oh, I'll let you know five minutes before the okay. dinner. <laughs> okay, but so this is a really important thing for people around Rebel Snow. And one of the things about the quiz is it's really great to take the quiz because you know what yourself is. But the advantage of like reading the book, The Four Tendencies, is you can study other people's tendencies. Because this is a thing where people will say, my feelings are so hurt. This person just ghosts me all the time. Like we make plans and they back out at the last minute. We have tickets and they don't want to go or they refuse to commit. And I'm like, it has nothing to do with you. This rebel just doesn't like the feeling of being chained to a calendar. Say something like, hey, I'd love to hang out before I leave on my big trip. I'm going to be around this weekend. So like if you're around Friday night, let me know if you feel like going out. And it's like, if you feel like it, we could change it at any minute, like give a lot of options, like a lot of freedom, but they're, they don't like this feeling of being trapped, but it hurts people's feelings and, yeah. and frustrates them. They don't understand. This is just a rebel way. It has, it's, it's nothing about the relationship. It's just like, 
Yeah, rebels don't like that. It's very <laughs> predictable. They don't, they just, they don't like working that way. I do, I do actually still go, but it's always like 10 minutes before I'm like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have committed to this. And even when I quit my law firm, the number one thing I tell people that I love about being an entrepreneur and working for myself is that I don't have to set an alarm clock in the morning because I hate being told by an alarm clock when to wake up. I would like to wake up on my own accord. Yeah, <laughs> right. There you go. I mean, that's exactly, like, I don't want anything telling me what to do. Even an alarm clock that I set myself. No, that's, it, it just, it's funny though. And I, what do you think of this? To me, I think that the rebels are the most misunderstood of the four tendencies. I think they're the ones that the other people don't have insight. In. They don't understand the rebel perspective. I think the most. I would agree. Don't you think? Yeah. I think that people, I think upholders, questioners, and obligers understand each other better. I feel like rebels are the hardest for people to understand. And I think they get it wrong a lot. Have you ever worked with somebody who like was trying to like more and more closely manage you instead of saying, oh, this is a person who needs freedom. Let mm -hmm. me back off and just like let her do her work her way and blow me away with the results. But it's somebody who's like, let's check in. Let's have a weekly meeting. Let me know where you are. I need yeah. to have, you know, and then you're like, well, now I'm now I'm in a resist, resist, resist. This is my new idea for you too. Do you do corporate engagements? Like I do a lot of corporate speaking. Okay, okay, yeah, you already yeah, did yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. dating one is fresh. <laughs> the, the dating one is fresh, but the, no, but no, I have I have spoken. Here's something interesting. I've had a lot of people ask me about how to screen for obligers because they only want to hire obligers. Oh. And I don't tell them because I do, I think that I, they have an exploitative gleam in their eye as they ask that, and I'm like you, and and the thing and the truth is you want to mix. Because every, all the tendencies, all the tendencies have great strengths. All the tendencies have weaknesses and limitations. And so if you have too much in a team, you're going to have too much of certain qualities and not enough of the other. So you need a mix. But many people do want, because they're like, those are the people who go the extra mile and who, you know, it's, um, oh, but here's something interesting about obligers. So, and may, I don't know if you've ever seen this in your husband. Obliger rebellion is when obligers meet, 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 meet expectations. Then suddenly they snap. And they're like, this I won't do. <laughs> and they're like, it could be something small. Oh, yeah. OK, yes. something small. Like, I'm not going to answer your emails or something big. Like, I'm going to quit this job because obliger rebellion happens when obligers feel like they're being taken advantage of or ignored or exploited. And the fact is, they feel like they're being exploited. And they are because obligers are the ones that questioners, rebels and upholders will take advantage of because they're the people who will go the extra mile. Yeah. And that's where the, the salt of the earth. And that's why they make incredibly valuable employees and coworkers and neighbors and family members, because they're very much likely to come through. But when it becomes too much, then you have this obliged rebellion. But sometimes it's like, we've been friends for 25 years and you're just too needy and I've had it. And now I'm ghosting you and I'm, I'm cutting off all ties and there's no explanation. And it's just that it's it. It's the end. Or like I woke up this morning and I realized, you know what? We're getting a divorce. And I, it, I've done, I've had it, no discussion. I'm quitting this job right now, today. This is it. I'm going to work for a competitor this afternoon. And sometimes that can be really positive. It can be really constructive and beneficial. And it's meant to be beneficial. It's meant to save the obliger from a situation where expectations have become so kind of unsupportable. But there can be a lot of reputational risks because it's like, but Erica, I asked you if you wanted to be on this committee and you said you would. So I don't understand now why you're so angry at me because it's, it's like it doesn't make sense to me. But once you see the pattern of obliger rebellion, you will see it everywhere. It's in movies. It's in TV shows. You see it in all the people around you. It's very common. But until you understand what it is, it feels very mysterious because even obligers will say I'm acting out of character. I don't understand where this came from. I feel like I'm exploding. I don't have control over this. It's just coming out of nowhere. Do you think of a movie, even something like um, It's a Wonderful Life, is basically the story of an obliger rebellion. You know, the most extreme obliger rebellion. So it's good in a marriage to be very aware of it so that you can start feeling like, oh, I feel the resentment and the anger building. But why is it, I always wonder when, when my obliger husband has yeah. these obliger rebellions, I just wonder why he can't just say it as it's, it's building up. <laughs> that is a great question. And but it's not something that obligers are typically good at. And so it's really it's behooves all of us of the other three tendencies to be looking for those signs, because I bet if you look for the signs, there's like snarky comments or like there's there's kind of like there will start to be behavior that you're like, OK, he's starting to get annoyed here. It's starting to be too much. The balance is getting out of whack. But like if you, one thing that obligers will say, let's say you're in a workplace 
you could look out for other obligers because you might not be good about saying it for yourself, but you would feel very comfortable walking into a manager's office and saying, like, I don't understand why everybody else is on three committees, but Eric is on nine committees and that's not fair. Or one person's taking all the night shifts and nobody else is pulling their pulling their weight. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can stand up for someone else or something that obligers will sometimes do if they tend to get like pulled into too many projects because it's hard for them to say no is just to be like, have a friend and it's like, ooh, I'm going to call Erica and say, should I say yes to this or not? And Erica was like, don't do that. Why would you, you know, a questioner would be like, why would you do that? And a polder would say like, what else do you have on your plate? And they'll, you know, and another obliger would be like, I don't think, you know, it's too much for you. And so just even to have that delay and to have somebody kind of help you figure out how to say no, instead of saying yes on the spot, because obligers sometimes will sort of get themselves over committed. And usually they're great. And that's why people keep asking them. And they're the ones who are likely to say yes. And so they get asked to do a lot because of that. Wow. So you're saying that a lot of these employers are asking to hire obligers only. Why don't they just have that as a pre-screening screening quiz, the four tendencies? I wonder if some of them do. Because so, on my website, like if you go to GretchenRubin.com, there's like a lot of resources. There's like a nutshell guide. So you can tell what you can figure out someone's tendency, even if you can't make them take the quiz. And there's all these things about how to use it in healthcare and how to use it uh, with children and how to use it at work. And so I think I think a lot I have talked to people where I definitely think that they are now they're now trying to figure this out because you can ask questions about like, how do you feel about New Year's resolutions? Because rebels are what would you say if I said, how do you feel about New Year's resolutions? What would your answer be? I cannot do them. Right. It's like, why would you? Right. Yeah. Right. And as an upholder, I love them. <laughs> do you stick with um, them? I make them all the time. Stick to them. Stick what with were them. What were yours this year? This year, I mean, I, I kind of, I kind of don't even wait for New Year's Day. Now <laughs> I just sort of make them whenever I want. Oh, well, one thing that I did this year is I started napping. I had read all the research about napping, and so I was like, I want to take a twenty because it, it's twenty two for twenty two. I had twenty two things I wanted to do in twenty two. So I was like, I want to nap for twenty two minutes a day, and because just to see if this research holds up. So that was a big resolution that I made. Is it working? I love it. I love it. I love it. Huge fan of the nap. If you can, if you have the luxury of being able to take a nap in the middle of the day, it, it really. There's so much research about why it's it's really does boost your focus and your productivity and your energy level. I'm again so all or nothing that if I take a nap, I don't want an alarm to wake me up, so it ends up being a three hour nap. But try, you know, you might try it for like for a week and see, because I actually, even if I don't set an alarm, I wake up within like 22 or 25 minutes. Really? Oh, and there's also something Dan Pink wrote about the nappuccino. What you can do is you can have a cup of coffee and it takes about 25 minutes to go through your bloodstream. And so you, you have your cup of coffee, you take your nap, and then the caffeine wakes you up. So you don't have an alarm and you have the fun of having the coffee, but it, it kind of gives you that kick to like wake up alert. So, Interesting. Yeah. In his book, The Power of Now, he writes about the nappuccino. Yeah. That's such a good New Year's resolution. I'm glad it's working for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then questioners are like, I'll do it whenever it makes sense for me. I wouldn't do it on January 1st because January 1st is an arbitrary date. So that's like the kind of question you can you can often get a sense of someone's tendency just by asking them a few questions. And then in the uh, my work one pager, it has like things like strengths and weaknesses that you would see. And so I, th I think people I think some people do do try to figure that out when they're hiring. But again, like if you have a team, you want some of everything. I think yeah. I think it's very easy to hire someone who's like you because you get it. Mm -hmm. But like, like you say, you wouldn't want to work with a team of rebels. No, absolutely it would not. not work. And <laughs> if I working with a team of upholders, it would be terrible. Yeah. What was the process for actually figuring out these four tendencies? Was there one that you found right away and you were like, this is one and then you built around that or? This was the hardest intellectual endeavor of my entire life, far harder than law school because I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't like now that there are four, it feels very neat. But I didn't know what this was. I sensed that certain patterns, like people saying January 1st is an arbitrary date, whereas the arbitrariness of it never bothered me. Or people saying the minute somebody tells me to do something, I don't want to do it. Or people, my friend on the track team, I had a sense that they were somehow related, but I couldn't figure out how they were related. And I didn't know, was this a spectrum? Like what? And I, and I, was, I would just think about it. And, there were, and then and all these sort of like anecdotes that somehow seemed related and then one day, I remember I was sitting at my desk. It was like the most exciting intellectual moment of my life. And I was like, the word, it was like expectations just jumped out at me. And I saw that there were these outer expectations and inner expectations. Like that I saw that there was a difference between a work deadline and a New Year's resolution. Because usually 
in a lot of these frameworks, they don't distinguish. And sometimes they'll talk about extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. It's not really that because you could be intrinsically motivated to do something where there's external accountability. So that gets very confusing. And then I realized that some people meet it and some people resist it. And, that, and, and, and it was just so thrilling because as I started to figure it out, I could see how all these patterns started to fit in. And like Oblige a Rebellion was something that I kind of dimly intuited, but I, how did it fit in? Or how did, it, how did it fit in that some people seemed unstoppable in one area? Or, or like one thing that people would say is like, I, I would be talking to an obliged friend, they'd be like, oh, I'm so lazy. I'm so lazy. Like I've been trying for years to go running every morning and I can't do it. I'm so lazy. And I'm like, obviously you're not lazy. I see you're this outstanding performer at work. You're never late picking up your kid from, like, I, I know you well enough that I would see that all these things are, that you're not lazy. So why is it that you're able to do these things like so proficiently mm -hmm. and then in other things you can't? And so, so it, it was really, but, but all of it started to, and then I had the idea, I was trying to make it a two by two matrix as one does. But when I realized it's actually a Venn diagram of four circles that overlap and that rebels, you can be a rebel who tips to questioner or you can be a rebel who tips to obliger, or I'm an upholder who tips to questioner, but some upholders tip to obliger, that that also was kind of added uh, another layer. It was a long process of just figuring it out. And then I kept thinking, oh, of course, someone else has figured this out, right? Because once you know it, it's very obvious. I can do the Game of Thrones characters. I can do the Parks and Recs characters. Mm -hmm. But no one, I don't think anybody else ever. I was so afraid that like wow. I would find out that somebody else had discovered it before me. But I think I really did truly discover it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was really exciting. It was real because it had like the perfection of nature. Because you know, like the periodic table of the elements, like they knew that there were elements that were there that just hadn't been discovered yet because the table of the elements said that there had to be an element there. And I felt like this is just like, it's like a fern frond. It was like, you know, it just, it had this perfection of nature. Like everything was filled in, nothing was blank, nothing was left over. Yeah, it was it was exciting. It was very, very intellectually exciting. Are you thinking about the next thing that's going to be that you're going to have that intellectual moment and discover something that no one else has discovered? Or is the four tendencies something that you really feel like you want to pursue that further and further? Both. So the four tendencies, I just keep going deeper and deeper because people keep telling me, even just like you and I were talking about being rebels. And it's like people give me all these new insights. And so I keep at, I have this giant document where I add, I, I just keep adding more and more. Originally, I wrote for the four tendencies was just something in my book better than before. It was just one chapter of 21 strategies. But then everybody's like, I know I want to know more about the first. So then I wrote that book and now I'm thinking, oh, I got to I got to write another book because I'm so excited by that. But then I do feel like there's other things. I'm, I'm, the project I'm working on now is about the five senses. And that's much more about going deeper and like understanding how to get the most out of our tendencies. So I don't feel like I've had some like late breaking epiphany that's going to shake up the world. But I really I do hope that I can help people sort of engage more deeply with their five senses. And I have some some fun quizzes that I think will be help people sort of see themselves more clearly, because I sure learned a lot about myself writing this book. Like I did. I like I'm super focused on texture, which yeah. I didn't even know about myself. How do you not know? <laughs> but I didn't know until I started thinking about it. You mentioned that there there's a lot of feedback that you've gotten since the Four Tendencies book. What are the top one or two things that come to mind that you wish you would have written added to the book? That is a great question. I think that I would have written more about how in the workplace you really do need to have diverse teams because I do see that people don't appreciate other tendencies strengths as much. You sort of it's just like when you do work, when you do work or chores, you're very aware of what you do and you kind of underappreciate what others do. There's a lot of research showing that. And I think that with teams like you might like questioners might be like, well, everyone, nothing is more valuable than like analysis and making like efficient, correct choices. So why we wouldn't why wouldn't we want to have all questioners and they don't understand why you need an upholder you need an obliger, you need a rubble. And so I wish that I had given more examples about how everybody brings something to it because you're very aware of like when the conflict arises. Mm -hmm. A great place for this, if, you, if you're working in an office, if you go look at the signs in the office kitchen, you will see all the four tendencies there battling it out, right? About like who's like who and why people should put mugs in the dishwasher or whatever. Um, <laughs> Please so don't you, steal food from the refrigerator. Right, 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 I remember that right, right. mine. But um, 
so you're very aware of like the conflicts that can arise, but I think sometimes it's easier to overlook the benefits that arise um, and how you need, you need that different, those different strengths coming together to be a really fully functioning team. Yeah. Have you thought at all about how the four tendencies can relate to money and financial issues people are having or financial successes? Yes. Well, and especially when you're thinking about like, how should I go about it in the way that's right for me? So an upholder is much better at like making a plan and sticking to it. And they find that very gratifying. Um, a questioner, what, what can happen to questioners sometimes is analysis paralysis, where their need for perfect information can make it hard for them to make a decision or move forward. And so they might be like, well, I can't decide the best benefit plan, or I can't de decide the rest, the best strategy, or I can't identify the, if I want to hire a financial advisor, but I can't figure out who the best one is. So they need to have their, their strategies that questioners can use to help them kind of move forward. You know, at the very least, it's like the financial plan you have is 100% be is better than the financial plan you don't have. You know, the whole old adage about the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago and the second best time is now. So questioners need to like understand how they might be in analysis paralysis. Obligers often benefit from thinking about other people. I need to do this because I need to be financially independent so that I don't become dependent on someone else. It might very well be that someone else is going to be dependent on me and I want to be able to provide for them. I need to think ahead. As an upholder, I used to think you should do it for yourself. Don't do it because it's important to someone else. But for obligers, that's often very, very compelling that they or like I want to have enough money so that I can give 10 percent to to the organizations that I support. So I need to make enough money so that I can afford to do that. And then for rebels, it's very much about identity or and also freedom and choice. So for rebels, it might be something like, I don't want to get stuck. I don't want to get trapped. I want to be able to, if I want to travel anywhere in the world, I want to be able to do that. If I want to quit my job and start my own and like be an entrepreneur, I want to have the financial freedom to do that. So for them, it's much more about like freedom and choice. Whereas for an obliger, it might be more like safety and providing. So I think that it's really helpful to, to think about the t tendencies in terms of like what is going to resonate with them and not just resonate with them in terms of like what they intellectually respond to, but what actually is going to change their behavior. Yeah. We were talking before, before the podcast started about how eventually I do want to write a book. And I, I love the idea that you can create little buckets for people around money to help them yes. better understand what their personality type yes. is. And then, you know, is a budget best for you or is this going to be best for yes. you? How would I go, knowing what you know about the research process, how would I go about that? Is it talking to a lot of people and then trying to thread together the similarities? Yeah. Or? I think so. And what I, at least what I found, and I bet you would find the same thing in money, is that if you're, if you talk to a lot of people, you will start to hear people using almost the same language in a way that's almost like, you're like, is the FBI beaming this in your head? Like with, with the four tendencies, whenever I would ask and find some like tip questions that sort of are like, you can keep asking the same question over and over. So when I would ask people, how do you feel about New Year's resolutions? Questioners would always say, I will keep a resolution when it makes sense to me, but I would not do it on January 1st because January 1st is an arbitrary date. They would say it almost verbatim to the point where I'm like, this is obviously a deep chord that I don't respond to, but others are because I'm hearing that over and over again. And so I think, I mean, you talk to a million people, you hear from a million people, you're so engaged, you start saying like, okay, what are these themes that keep coming back over and over? And I think it's almost, I think I'm in a polder, which is a fringe type and you're a rebel, which is a, like a fringe type. We're the two smallest tendencies. I think that's an advantage because I think, we don't respond the way most other people respond. So it stands out to us. And I think that's an advantage because if you're, if you're an obliger, that's the biggest tendency. And so that's good because you're speaking, you're, you understand like what the most people are going through, mm -hmm. but then maybe you don't understand that it's particular, you know, where I think if, if you're sort of having an experience that's a little bit off, then you can kind of be like, oh, that's interesting that some people always are talking about 20 years in the future. Like, why yeah. is it that some people, it's like, all they talk about is 20 years, 20 years, 20 years in the future. And other people are talking about five. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what these patterns would be, but I bet once you start listening, you'll start picking it up. I think you're right. It was surprising. I did a survey of my audience, maybe a few months ago, 10,000 people responded and looking through questions like, what are your money goals or yes. what do you want to yeah. accomplish? Or what find? are your biggest financial regrets? So many trends. Like I remember being able to control F 
and finding like there you 200 go, hundred of the same responses. See, that's exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. And maybe and maybe somehow you structure your book around that. You know, where it's like the 20 biggest complaints people have or something like that, because you do, it is really interesting because I think all of us kind of feel like we're, we're just like out there on our own and we're totally idiosyncratic and like nobody has this, thing, you know, and then you realize like abstainer, I thought I was the only abstainer in the world. And it turns out there's a lot of abstainers like you. Yeah. Um, so what were some of the trends you saw? This is so fascinating. A lot of people, it's beautiful. They care about others. They want to set their kids up financially. There you go, like their Steve. top goal is not their finances. Their top goal is their kids' finances or their parents' finances. Well, there you go. That That's was like a, it, that gives me chills. It's a beautiful one. A lot of people just like have this mentality that they will never be able to get rich. There's a question I ask in my survey about, do you think you'll be a mil you'll become a millionaire? And it's sad, the number of people that just say no. They've already, at the young age of 20 or 30, they've already determined that they will not become millionaires. Those are kind of the two that stand out to me right that's now. That's really interesting. But I mean, the, the question about for others or yourself, that's, you could see how that's a huge schism in terms of how you would reach somebody. I mean, again, this is one of the things I think is interesting about the four tendencies is if you're dealing with students or clients or customers, or you're trying to create a curriculum, or you're trying to create like a, just like a campaign that people are going to respond to, you have to realize like the same message isn't going to hit people the same way. And for some people, the idea that you would save in order to take care of your your two year old child, like they'd be like, oh, that's so far in the future. I can't even think of it. Whereas for someone else, that could be complete the most compelling thing. This will be a good exercise. I should go back through the questions and see what other trends I find, because maybe that is the next book for me. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because for me, it was even words spontaneity, like yeah. realize, because I was like, I'm like some people really value spontaneity. I, I, I just don't value spontaneity. like I negative value spontaneity or where it's arbitrary. Like, I'm like, I don't walk around worrying about whether things are arbitrary, but clearly for some people, they're like five, five items in a dressing room. It's arbitrary, 65 miles per hour. It's arbitrary. Like, ar and I'm like, okay. Like it doesn't bother me, but so sometimes it's even like specific language. A lot of people may not know this about you, but you were a very, very successful attorney. You- Yeah, we are both former <laughs> lawyers. It, sort of. But <laughs> you practiced though, right? Did you? And I clerked you and clerked. I was like a summer associate, but I never had like a, like a, I never had like an actual job at a law firm permanently. Oh. No. So after you clerked, that's Oh no, I did. I, well, I worked, I worked at the Federal Communications Commission as a legal advisor. So, I, but it was at a government. So I wasn't like at a law firm, like you were at a law firm. I was never at a law firm, but I was, I guess I was sort of, I was, I could have had that job even if I hadn't been a lawyer, but I, you would only give that job to a lawyer. So, but at the, for the, for the government. Yeah. For and, like but you clerked for a Supreme Court justice. I did for Sandra Day O'Connor. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And so, so to put this into perspective for the audience members who don't understand, this is like when you talk about the smartest people graduating from law school in the country, only like the top, how, how many is it? 24 maybe? that get to clerk each year? Well, there are year. nine justices and some have four and some have three. Okay. And a couple of retired justices have some. So, it's so you not have to be many. like the yeah. top, top, yeah. top. I remember at Georgetown Law where I went to school, there were maybe two that went on to clerk for Supreme Court justice. And that's like a huge deal. So you made it to the very top of the legal profession. And then you decided that, oh, that's not what I want to do. Yeah. What was it that made you make that decision. Well, one thing about me is like, I will get intensely interested in something like habits or the four times, you know, whatever color. And, um, I was clerking and I was out on from my lunch hour one day. And I thought, you know, and I would sometimes ask myself rhetorical questions. And so I said, what am I interested in that everyone else is, in the world is interested in? And I thought, well, power, money, fame, sex. And it was like power, money, fame, sex. And I just started doing all this research. To me, they felt very kind of uh, connected. Like they were, it was like a set. And I just kept doing more and more and more research. And finally, I was like, this is the kind of research a person would do if they were going to write a book. And I thought, well, maybe I could write that book. And I went to the bookstore and got a book called something like How to Write and Sell Your Nonfiction Book Proposal. And I followed the directions. And that became my first book. It was called Power, Money, Fame, Sex, A User's Guide. And that so but but it was it was less about wanting to leave law, but more about 
and not even just like wanting to be a writer. It was like, I want to write this specific book. And in fact, I'm like halfway done writing this specific book. Can I get it published? And so it, I, it, it was an easier transition for me because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And did you ever think you would go back to the law or it was a clear decision that? Well, it was funny because my husband, um, my husband was all, we met in law school. And when I, we moved from Washington, D.C. to New York and we both quit our jobs. And, um, and I was like, I'm going to work full time and trying to be a writer. At this point, I'd rather fail as a writer than succeed as a lawyer. So I got to give it a shot. So I was like trying to get an agent, trying to write a book proposal. And he switched it to finance. So he got like a starter job in finance. And we were in our apartment, like our first married person's apartment. And uh, our we got our dues for the bar fees, which are expensive. Oh, they are. It's very yes. expensive to be a member of the bar. And so we got our bar fees. And I said to him, are we going to pay our bar fees? And he was like, he's a questioner. He said, why would we pay our bar fees? <laughs> and I was like, OK, I guess we're doing this. Like, woo -hoo. Um, at, at the time, I thought, like, this was it, right? Um, and now I find out like, yeah, you can go back and pay your bar fees and like there's a way you can get reinstated in the bar. But uh, at the time, it felt like we're we're burning this bridge like we're 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 crossing to the to to the other side. So what I never did, people, did look back. What did people around you say? What did your parents say? What did other law students you went to school with say? Well, it's funny because Justice O'Connor was very supportive of it. And I'm not I don't even have like the baddiest job. Um, one of her clerks who's a couple years ahead of me, like left to eventually became like a tenor in the Boston opera, though now he's being a lawyer again. But so that was kind of even more unexpected than being a writer. She was very supportive. And I, I really was lucky because everybody in my life was very supportive of me taking a big risk. You know, now, especially now that I have children myself, I understand like why out of the deepest love, people, they don't want you to risk failure. They don't want you to fail. They don't want you to have your feelings hurt. They don't want you to take a risk. And so I feel really lucky that everybody around me was very much like, okay, you're gonna start all over. I had no clips, I had no manuscript, I had nothing. They were like, this is great, okay, yeah, <laughs> go for it. They were very supportive. What's something Justice O'Connor taught you that you still remember to this day? Well, you know, it was interesting. After I started writing about happiness, so the happiness project I was working on, and so I, was in her, I went to go see her when I was in DC, and I said, what do you think is the secret to happiness. And without a pause, like she clearly had thought of it already. She said, work worth doing. Mm. And I think that's the, the, the longer I've thought about it, the more true I think that is. And of course, some work is not paid. Some work, even people work in all different ways. But work worth doing is really important for a happy life. So that was something. And she also, what, what was the word she used? Um, perfunctory. She, something that she wrote, she's like, that's, that's rather perfunctory. And now when I'm writing, I will, I will be like, well, I think Justice O'Connor would say I need to elaborate on that argument a little bit. It's pretty perfunctory. <laughs> I don't know, just the way she said it. You know, sometimes people say things and it just hits, it just sticks in your mind. I can hear her saying perfunctory. <laughs> what did law school teach you that has made you a good writer now? Well, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but how not to write. I remember it was, I was like, oh my goodness. Never again will I put myself in a place where I have to read so much stuff that is so unnecessarily hard to understand. This is completely unnecessary. We're not doing biochemistry here. Like there's just a lack of clarity in, in expression. And in the negative, I think it, it taught me to value clarity and simplicity and just really communicating as simply as you can. Um, but I, that was sort of in the negative. In the positive, I feel like it really taught me to make an argument. I will read many things where I'm like, you're assuming something that you haven't proven. I dispute your, your assumptions, so why should I read on? I'm completely unconvinced. Or you've made a big jump. Or, you know, your argument, you, you go on and on about something, and then you, you lightly skip over something else that's trickier, like as if I'm not going to notice that. <laughs> and so I feel like I am much better at like, making an argument. And I remember I wrote a book uh, called 40 Ways to Look at Winston Churchill, and I was in the final editing stages and I had some line about Winston Churchill. I don't even remember what it was. And I was in the library and I thought, OK, well, I say that, but you could say that. But then I would say that. Then you could say that. Then I would say that. And then you would say that. But then I would say that. And I'm like and, and I left the sentence unchanged. And I realized later I had been sitting there for like 15 minutes, just like playing this out in my head. And that's very much what lawyers do. They're like, you can't just argue something. You have to think, well, what would somebody how would somebody 
respond? Mm -hmm. How would they how would they return that argument? Because it's very easy to make one side of an argument if you ignore that somebody else has very good arguments themselves. No, it's funny you mentioned that about law school, how legally is just intentionally so difficult to read. And my theory, honestly, is that it's it's a gatekeeping mechanism. Lawyers do not want normal non-lawyers to be able to read legalese. Otherwise, they cannot justify their high fees. That's why even some of my videos, for example, I'll try to break down American Airlines terms and conditions. Right. It, it, very difficult to read those terms and right. conditions. Right. Oh, 100%. They don't want yeah, yeah. normal non-lawyers to be able to read them. Yeah. That's why it's right. a big, you know, rebel personality of me to create a video in 30 seconds distilling that information. Yes. In fifth grade language, right? Right. You're trying to control me by boring me senseless and confusing me, but I'm going to find my own way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they make it so difficult, like even putting defined terms and then making the defined terms at the very beginning where like most people would not know that, okay, if it's, if two words are capitalized, that means it's a defined term. So there's actually, you have to go search what this defined term means. Right. So that's a great example of how legal training really can be very, very helpful. No, I feel like it was invaluable. I'm so glad that I went, even though I'm not a lawyer now, because I do feel like it's a very valuable. But it does make you realize, like, yeah, words can obfuscate as well as clarify, for sure. I'm curious, because as this internationally best-selling author, you've obviously built a team around you. How have you thought about the four tendencies as you've built your own team? Well, um, I've thought about it a lot and I always want to know, I'm, I'm so curious about everybody's tendency, uh, any, anybody that I meet. But one thing, so if I know that someone's an obliger, I really make sure to understand, to not overload that person accidentally. Because I know as an upholder, it's very easy for me to push back, but for obligers, that can be difficult. So for instance, I have a podcast, the Happier with Gretchen Rubin podcast. And at one point I, and I'm an upholder, And so I like working, like I like sending emails all the time. I work all the time. I send emails all the time at midnight, at 4 a.m., on Christmas Day. uh, You're on vacation. I'm on vacation. I'm sending emails. And and my view is I don't have to be your babysitter. You do work in your way. None of this is is life-threatening. So just answer the email when it's right for you. But I was working with an obliger who felt like I wasn't respecting the work-life boundary. And she felt like anytime I sent her an email, it created an expectation that she would answer. And she was feeling resentful. I heard about this third hand. And so the question is, okay, what do we do? Like, do I have to convince her that I'm right? Is she right? Do we have to have some kind of HR principle, you know? But instead it was just like, I learned how to use delay delivery. And so she would get her emails at like 8 a.m. on Monday through Friday. And I would send the emails whenever I wanted because I used delay delivery. And so that was a way that I could work with an obliger in a way that worked for the obliger, but that also worked for me. And so I feel like when I know someone's tendency, I can think about possible traps or like I work with a questioner and I can see that sometimes the questioner is starting to go into analysis paralysis. And I need to say things like, well, we need to have an answer by Friday or, well, let's consider three options, but we don't, this isn't important enough to consider 15 options. Or is there somebody whose work we respect that we can ask? What, how do they do it? Because maybe we don't need to like reinvent the wheel. Maybe we can find somebody who does it well and kind of learn from their experience rather than doing all of our own research. Um, And with other upholders, like I work very closely with an upholder and I love that. I really, I mean, that is the thing. It is sometimes nice to work with somebody who's your tendency because you just get it. But I do know that working with somebody who's an upholder, we could become rigid. We could start Uh, executing on things we don't need to execute. We need those questioners and those rebels being like, well, why are we doing this? Maybe we should do something totally different. We don't have to do it just because people tell us to. Like we, we need that energy of pushing back. It really has helped me to figure out how to communicate with people better. Um, Or like I work with a rebel um, sort of loosely. And whenever I, whenever I email him, I always say things like, if it works for you, at some point you could do this. Or like, if you felt like this would be something that was appealing, like I always frame it as like your choice, your freedom, if it works for you, because I know, whereas like my sister and she's an obliger, she's also my sister, but she's an obliger. I'll be like, I need you to do this. And she's like, okay, <laughs> you know, and it's like, I don't waste my time being like, blah, 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 blah. But I know with the rebel, if I just say like, hey, do this, they're going to be like, yeah, I don't need to do that. And I don't want to ignite that spirit of resistance. It's interesting because I spend a lot of time trying to help people to make more money in their careers. And in order to make more money, you usually have to have these difficult conversations about, hey, boss, like, let's speak about having a raise. And now I'm realizing that that system 
that corporate system of having to ask for a raise, having to advocate for yourself in order to yeah. go up the corporate ladder, that probably only lends to certain personality types. It's difficult. It's more difficult for certain tendencies. Yeah, I think it's true. And I think you can, and I think like with all the tendencies, you can reframe things in a way to make it easier for you. So if you feel sheepish about asking for yourself, like maybe you would want to say something like, hey, look, I got to bring home the bacon for my family. And like, yeah, I don't feel like having this conversation, but they're all counting on me. Or I've heard of somebody did a, uh, a funny thing where she needed to study for the bar. So she put a picture of like a vacation home on the refrigerator. And she said to her family, see that picture? If I pass the bar, then we can go to that vacation house. If I don't pass the bar, we're staying here this summer and I'm studying for the bar and you guys are hanging around the house. So everybody helped me. And so that was a way to get everybody focused on we need to cooperate so we can get what we want and also to give herself that sense of responsibility, which is like, they're all counting on me. And so it worked both ways, both in like helping everybody around her mm -hmm. to try to help and then also to try to create the accountability for herself. So I think when you know your tendency and you know other people's tendency, you can figure out how to structure things in a way that's going to be more efficient, more effective than just assuming that one thing is going to work. I mean, another good example, somebody was telling me, so they were switching to a different software program at their work. And if you've dealt with questioners, you know that a lot of times they're like, I'm not switching until I think it makes sense. And you could say like, oh, everybody has to switch and they just won't. Like this is something that they will regulate. They just will quietly not go along, which is often not helpful. So one thing, like, let's say you have a big meeting and you're like, I'm here to explain. There's this big policy change. Corporate has said we're all switching software. Do you have any questions? And so some hands go up, you're answering questions. And then there's like two or three people their hand is up, their hand is up, and everybody else is getting very visibly annoyed. So one thing that you can do to balance out that there's different needs for people in, in, in this whole big team is to say, if you've heard enough, feel free to go back to your work. If you still have questions, I'm happy to stay here and answer any questions you have because you need to get those questioners on board. If they're going to follow along, they have to understand why this is being done. And then once they do, they're complete team players. And by the way, it's really good for everybody to be like, why are we switching to the software? If you can't defend it, if it's not a better choice, then why are we doing it? Like, that's a really good exercise for everyone. Um, but that not everybody else needs to sit through that. And so you can manage in a way so that you can manage the needs of all the tendencies without forcing them all to sort of participate in all of it. You can think about, well, how do I accommodate all of the strengths and all of the weaknesses, but in a way that it doesn't, you know, doesn't yeah. take every hour of every day. It can, be, it can be tricky. It can definitely be tricky. Obviously, in this day and age, to become a best-selling author, the content itself has to be top tier. But a lot of it is also related to the marketing aspects. So you have to be kind of a good marketer to become a best-selling author in this day and age. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I think that's true. Are you naturally a good marketer or is it something that you have to go out of your comfort zone to do? Well, partly is when you're published by one of like a regular publishing house, they'll do a lot of marketing for you. And then part of, so part of it is like, do you cooperate with that or not? And I'm very happy to cooperate with it. And one thing I find is like, I really love to engage with people. I mean, just like in talking, like I get so many ideas from other people. I feel like the world is my research assistant. And so I feel like partly it's not that I think of it as marketing. I think of it more like I'm engaging or I'm interested or I'm asking or I'm learning. And that itself is a form of marketing. But maybe that feels easier to me um, because it feels like I'm gaining knowledge mm -hmm. and insight from other people. But I think it often works as marketing because when I'm trying to engage with people about subjects that are interesting to me, well, the people who are who are drawn to that are the people who are interested in the same things that I am. And then hopefully they'll be interested in the projects that I'm working on. No, I love that. What is the Gretchen Rubin business? What, what would you say is the business model and where are the income streams coming from? So there's a lot going on. So uh, one is the books. I have the, a podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin. And so uh, I have a weekly podcast. I have like and uh, on Wednesdays, which is like 40 minutes with my sister. On Mondays, I have like a two minute podcast. It's like a little story. And then every other week we have a kind of more laid back conversational podcast. So that's sort of a whole suite of podcasts, which is supported by advertising. Mm -hmm. I have an app called uh, the Happier app, and that has got a free tier and a subscription tier. And that's super fun. And I've had and it won an award. And uh, that's been a really exciting way to use the four tendencies to try to help people how to steer them towards the habit tracking tools that will work best for them. Because like a don't break the chain 
might not work. It sounds like you like Don't Break the Chain, but a lot of times rebels don't like Don't Break the Chain, but they might like something like a photo log. So anyway, it tries to help you use the power of knowing your four tendencies to help you stick to your habits. So that's one thing. I do a lot of speaking. Um, I have a shop, so I have journals, and it's all related to my research related to happiness and good habits. It's like like a, a big thing, back to what we were talking about earlier, knowing yourself turns out to be incredibly important because when you know you're an abstainer, you'll do things in a different way. If you know you're a rebel, you'll do things in a different way. If you know you're a simplicity lover versus an abundance lover. I mean, there's just a lot of ways we're knowing yourself. And so I have journals that help you ask yourself questions that will help you figure out yourself. You think it's easy to know yourself, but it's actually hard. And, and a lot of little tools, like there's this tackle box with all different post-it notes. Like there's the to-do list, which a lot of people use. Yeah. There's the to-da list, which is like a lot of times, especially obligers, if they make a list of everything they've already done, that kind of energizes them. There's a to-do list for people who want to like not write a list. There's a could-do list for rebels who are like, if it's on a to-do list, I don't want to do it, but I could do it if I felt like it. So I'll make a list of what I could do. <laughs> Might could. So it's like all those different things. So I have a, a, a bunch of different tools there and, and like mugs. And if you can get a Four Tendencies mug if you want. Uh, a lot of people like that. So I have a, a bunch of different things all going on. And they all kind of, I have a newsletter that's free. A lot, a lot of different things that are all feeding into each other. Can I guess the order? I, I would assume that the highest, in terms of revenue is the book yeah, followed by speaking followed by podcast oh really the podcast advertising yeah so you're getting sponsors on your podcast I just take advertising I'm part of the Cadence 13 network so they oh. sell advertising yeah okay then speaking yeah and then well speaking and- is kind of weird because of uh, because of COVID Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I don't really before COVID. Yeah, it yeah was well, mostly... COVID, it was COVID. It, yeah, it was, it was, and now it's coming back. But it's all sort of like, yeah, COVID made everything weird. And that's mostly corporate speaking engagements where yeah. Procter and Gamble will say, "Hey, can you come and help us?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understand yeah, which our I, employees. which I love, which I love. I love that. It's so fun to like drop into these companies or cultures and and just be part of it for a day. I love that. Yeah. I feel like as an entrepreneur, you wear many hats and not all of them you enjoy doing. I would guess that for you, the writing you enjoy the most. Yes. What is an aspect of the business of Gretchen Rubin that you don't enjoy so much? Well, appropriately, like the financial part where like I have, you know, there's this account and that account and which goes there and what goes there. And if I'm filling out a form, is it this LLC or that LLC? I'm constantly having to look things up. And, <laughs> and you know, and you feel like I really don't want to get this wrong. I can't just like wing it. So I'm fortunate that I have people that I can ask. But I do. I find that that stuff is just very I, I, I wish that I liked that better, or that I was more intrigued by 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 that aspect of it. I do find it pretty, pretty pretty dry. For the business, what do you see right now as the single biggest opportunity for you? And then in general, how do you plan on expanding? What are you excited about? So my next book is about the five senses and I would love to do like a television docu-series. I've done a little bit of television and I came very close, like was like my book, The Happiness Project was optioned, prescripted, got very close, but as always happens, it fell apart. So I would love to do like a, like a docu-series on the five senses. I think that would be tremendously fun. And the five senses is just so juicy and so interesting. Like, I, I just think there's a million different things. So I would love to try to do that. I would love to do TikTok. I want to get into that. I want, yes. Um, uh, I recently put the podcast up on YouTube just mm-hmm. this year in 2022. Um, that was also exciting because we got to have captions. And so, and we're soon going to add transcripts to the, to my site. So very focused on more accessibility, but I want to do more with just like video on, on social media platforms. Cause I do feel like that's a great, great way to engage with an audience. And, uh, and that's, and that's really what I love to do is to engage with people about ideas. When you made the decision to not pay those bar fees and become a full-time writer, could you have anticipated any of this? No, because a lot of it didn't exist. Like, right. When I was doing that, it was just like, you were just a writer. Like there was no other thing to do. And I think I was kind of unusual in that I was kind of a very traditional type of writer who was very eager to embrace new technologies. And I've sort of added them all. I think one thing that's really intimidating for people who are becoming writers now is they see, oh, I have to do all of this stuff. Whereas for me, I was sort of adding one thing after another. And a lot of these things aren't that hard once they're up and going, but there's a lot of like starting costs of figuring things out. And so, um, so I wouldn't have anticipated any of this, none of this. 
but it's been exciting and it's really, really fun. It's really fun. I always thought of myself as a person who wanted to do one thing all the time, like not, but actually I think I like doing a lot of different things. No, that's amazing. I selfishly want to ask for my audience. Yeah. Of all of these studies that you've done on happiness and the four tendencies, what can I take away to give to my audience about how they can improve their money habits and mm. improve their overall finances? Like what are these trends that you've seen? Well, one thing is with money is that sometimes people, are, and I'm sure you you see this, where people are like, well, money can't buy happiness. But the fact is money can buy many things that j that contribute mightily to happiness. And one of the most important things that money can buy is the freedom from thinking about money. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, if you think about it now and you plan for it now, you're actually buying yourself freedom from it and peace of mind and not having to think about it. So I think sometimes people feel like, well, if I think about it at all, it's going to swamp me and consume me. And it's like, no, a lot of these things, you can kind of just like make up your mind and do it. So I would say one, a great thing, if you're trying to make changes, but it's hard, think about some, ask yourself the question of like, when you've successfully done something in the past, what worked for you? Because maybe you took a class and when you took a class, you were great at doing yoga, or maybe you did it with a friend and a friend guilted you into it and that made it, or maybe um, you did something in a new way and that was exciting and fun. And then think about, okay, well, given what I know about myself in the past, what might I do in the future? Like, if you're like, look, I need accountability. I'm an obliger. I don't do anything unless somebody's holding my hand. It's like, then you should get a, maybe you need to get a financial advisor because you need somebody who's going to help you figure out what to do, hold you accountable, set deadlines. And the fact is, and you're like, well, I don't want to pay for that. It's like, if this is going to set you up for the rest of your life and you can afford it, that's a good place to spend your money. Like that's a good happiness investment. Mm -hmm. If that's something that is going to set you up for success. I and mean, if you're somebody where you're like, look, I don't want to make decisions. I don't want to think about this. It's like, okay, set up automatic savings, automatic bill payment, automatic this, automatic that, and then just set it up and never look at it again. Because if you're, but then maybe you're somebody who's like, I don't like automatic bill paying. I like to look at everything. I, I need to check it. Then it's like, okay, well, what works for you? But look at the past because often what you've done that worked for you in the past is a good thing. And also, I mean, back to your point about how so many people said that they wanted to set up their children Think about what you want. Like, do you want security? Do you want to be able to support others? Do you want freedom to make radical changes at any time? Um, I remember I had two friends who went to law school and there's a lot of people who go into big law jobs and they make a lot of money. And they said, and they were, they were really interested in doing government jobs. And they said they would never have a lifestyle mm -hmm. where they couldn't both leave private sector jobs for public sector jobs because of financial. They had to live as if they both worked in the public sector all the time. And that was a, a decision they made when they were first married that had enormous consequences for the next, you know, 40 years. So I think, think about your values, because if one of your values is at any point, I would like to be able to have the life that I have with a lot less money. Yeah. Or I want freedom to do this or freedom to do that, or I just don't want to think about it. And the best way to not have to think about it is to have a lot of savings. I mean, what do you think? What do you see that works for people? I think for a lot of people, it's accountability. You can be accountable to your future self. Look, I don't want to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now and like kicking myself because I didn't, I didn't have compound interest working for me or I didn't take advantage of my company benefits or something because mm -hmm. I just didn't do it. Uh, so I have to think about my future self. I think the biggest problems I see from speaking to my followers are a lot of people just think that oh, it's too difficult. I don't know where to start. Right. So because they're scared, they don't yes. know where to start. Yes. They're scared of even starting. Yes. 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 Especially when it comes to investing, for example. It just right. seems, it's made out to seem so intimidating and inaccessible that people really believe that. And they, they think, oh, investing is only for the rich. I can't, yeah. I can't invest with just my $10 that I have saved up. Right. That's probably a big one that I see. And do you think that's particularly a problem for people who like didn't see their parents doing that kind of thing? So they don't have a mod, they don't feel like this isn't something that someone like me would do. Oh, for sure. I yeah. mean, I think it's a huge problem that culturally we're taught not to talk about money. Yes. So you hear your parents like, I don't know what, when I was young, I didn't know what my parents were making. I was no, not, I didn't either. I was not allowed to talk about money. No. So of course, when you become an adult, how am I all of a sudden expected to be able to confidently ask questions about money and right. feel confident entering the stock market? Right. 
a well, lot of it is how we're how we're raised. No, well, I think that's why what you do is so important because it makes people kind of like in the privacy of their own home, like they can watch and they can learn and they can feel like they're getting that growing sense of command mm -hmm. that then allows them to feel more confidence in taking action. Because with a lot of this, it's like, don't get it perfect, get it going, you know? Exactly. Um, because it's, and it, and it is intimidating. And you do feel like, well, am I going to make a bad choice that I'm going to regret later? And then sometimes you're just sort of, then you, 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 you don't do anything at all. Yeah. And I imagine also you found a lot of this in your studies of happiness comparison. So in yes. both ways, right? So in the finance space, comparison works in a bad way because when you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, yes. a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck because they're inflating their lifestyles to keep up with the people around them yeah. to impress people that they don't really need to be impressing. Yeah. And then on the other hand, they see people in who went to grade school with them who are so much more successful and they feel like they're so behind. And I think feeling like you're behind, yes. it leads to you feeling like, okay, well, what's even the point? Like, right. maybe this is my life. Maybe no. I'm not going to do well with my life. Right. No, it's social comparison. Um, but I think the one thing that can work for a lot of people is, uh, like you said, about getting started. It's like, maybe have like one thing a week or, or maybe like have your one word theme for the year be something like security or investment or uh, savings or whatever it is. And then think like, well, what's one thing I could do once a day, once a week, once a month? Maybe you have like, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three or whatever. And sort of say this like, and maybe the first day is I'm going to watch a five minute video that explains to me what whatever is, yeah. and, you know, and just really kind of, I, now this wouldn't work for rebels because they don't like feeling, maybe they don't feel like feeling trapped into it. But I think for a lot of people, it's like, just knowing what the, that there's a plan. Mm -hmm. My sister often says that action is the antidote for anxiety. And so it's being like, I don't feel financially sophisticated or secure right now, but I can imagine that that the end of the year, I could feel a lot better. I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to follow through on my plan little by little, step by step. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Make it into those manageable steps. This doesn't work for everybody. Some people like to take big steps. They like want to go big or go home. If that's you, then that's great. Yeah. But for many people, it's just like, let me just, you know, it's like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? You know, just take it step by step. And I think we often overestimate what we can do in a short term and we underestimate what we can do over the long term if we do it little by little. And this is definitely something with finance. Like it's like if you do little by little by little year after year after year, yep. you can end up in an extremely different place from somebody who didn't take those early first steps. That's actually one of my all time favorite quotes. I so when I graduated from law school, I had over two hundred thousand dollars of debt and my goal was to pay off that debt. But it wouldn't have been achievable for me if I said, oh, that is my ultimate goal. I had to break it into smaller goals. And I think with everything in finance, yeah. like you're saying, for most people, that is the way to do it. If you want to end up investing a thousand dollars, we'll break it up into fifty dollars segments. Right. I want to invest fifty dollars this month and the next month. Right. 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 Just making things more tangible because then you also feel the reward. Yes. Instead of waiting two, three, four yeah. years, people are not good at delayed gratification. No, they're not. People, we're in a society where we want instant gratification. So give yourself that. Make these smaller goals so that you do have that gratification in a month of wow, I, I accomplished this little part of it. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely true. And also, I mean, once you start doing a little bit, it's easier to do more because you sort of, especially with something like investing, the hardest the hardest dollar to invest is the first dollar because mm -hmm. you're like, what the heck am I doing? Like, how do I even set this up? And so just to trust that things get easier with time or that you get more adjusted to them. Yeah. I mean, a lot of you, just automatic. I mean, a lot of people are just like, have it happen automatically because if you have to touch it, you can, any decision you make could be the wrong decision. If you're a rebel, you might resist that decision. It's like if you set it up and automate it and it's just like running in the background, I think for a lot of people, that's really helpful too. Kind of on a different topic, something I've been wanting to ask is when I quit my law firm, I felt a loss of identity as this big law lawyer. The level of prestige that came with being able to say, hi, I'm Erica, yeah. I work at this law firm. People automatically assumed I was smart, I was successful. And when I quit, I felt like I lost a lot of that identity. So I want to ask you, as someone who was really, really successful as being at the top of their law school, being able to clerk for Supreme Court justice, to becoming an author, and I'm sure you didn't start off as a best-selling author. You no. had to go through that path. What was that like, and what advice do you give to people who 
are similarly thinking of going into a different career path from maybe the one that was designated for them? Well, it's definitely true. Like, yeah, I was clerking on the Supreme Court and I had been, you know, editor in chief of the the Yale Law Review, which is called the Yale Law Journal and uh, at Yale Law School. And um, so I had many feathers in my cap as a lawyer. And I and as I said, I started out from nothing. I didn't I hadn't been published in a newspaper or magazine. I didn't have a manuscript. I hadn't been on a literary magazine in college. Nothing. I'm starting from zero. And I feel like I was fortunate because I was just so focused on this project. I was just so absolutely committed to it and, and, and delighting in it and wanting to do it that sort of nothing else mattered to me. I was just, I was very, very focused on wanting to do that. And I was fortunate because I, through that, I did get an agent. And so that was able, that was able to get me onto the track of being a published writer, which is, which is not, which is not easy. And it's interesting because I think for me, I did want that so badly that that's what mattered to me. I didn't really, I, I didn't really pay attention if, if, if people thought it was surprising or if they had less respect for me. One thing that's kind of annoying about when you're an unpublished author is like anybody can be an unpublished author. They're writing a screenplay, they're writing a manuscript. And so it's sort of like that, that are you really doing it? But I just, I wanted it so badly that that's, that, that was all I really was focused on. So that made it easier for me. Did you have specific instances where any of your former colleagues, law students said, wow, you're making a big mistake? I think people who knew me would, were not surprised. I don't think I don't think that they were surprised. And the thing about going to law school is I went to law school for all the wrong reasons. I had a great experience and I'm very glad I went. But when I went, I was like, it's a great experience. I can always change my mind later. You know, it'll keep my options open. I'm good at research and writing. So I never went into it thinking that I saw myself as a lawyer, particularly. And when people say like, oh, so many people who who go into law aren't happy with it. I'm like, right, because you don't become a sound engineer if you're not really interested in being a sound engineer. You become a sound engineer because you're interested in being a sound engineer. But law, for whatever reason, attracts people who are maybe haven't even really, or, or kind of not so sure what they want to do with themselves, which was, my, which was my experience. So I don't think people were that surprised. What was the point in your writing career where you said, wow, I've made it externally. People will know that I've made it. When I hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list, I was like, <laughs> this is amazing. And of course, a lot of people think that The Happiness Project was my first book. It was my fourth book. So like many people, I worked for 10 years, very hard to become an overnight sensation. But I remember I was in a hotel. I was I was on a book tour. And so I, and I, it, it had come out. It had been number two the first week, which was huge, 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 huge. I mean, I'll take number two. That's fine. But I remember being in the hotel room and my editor being like, Gretchen, it's number one. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And then I and I had to go out and speak. And so I told everybody and they were all very happy for me. So so then I was just like, OK, this is something that I have that, you know, that's just very, very exciting as a as a writer to have that. And of course, many of my very, very favorite books have never been bestsellers. Um, it, there are many ways for a book to succeed. It's not the only thing that I think about. But that was definitely something where you're like, was there a moment of external an external metric that felt meaningful. Well, that, that external metric felt very meaningful. Yeah, That's it was huge. very, very exciting. Yeah, it was very exciting. Do you think there's going to be another moment in your career where you say, okay, I'm, I'm done being a writer. Next, I'm going to become this. You know, I don't think so because I really, when I look back to my whole life, I, 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 it, I wasn't like actually writing, uh, you know, like books, but I've always been doing things that were very writing adjacent. And I feel like I would do it even if nobody paid me or if nobody else was reading what I did. It's just sort of like, I just can't help myself. So I don't, I don't see a moment where I wouldn't be doing that, even if just only for myself. I love that. I want to close this with a little tradition we have. So the podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is about Gretchen Rubin Taught Me. So <laughs> what do you want people to walk away being able to say, Gretchen Rubin taught me this? Gretchen Rubin taught me that there is no magic one size fits all solution. Just because something works for someone else doesn't mean it works for me and vice versa. There are many ways to achieve an aim. If I'm finding it hard to get myself started saving or paying down my debt or investing or whatever, and people keep telling me you have to do this and you have to do that. And it's not working for me. There's nothing wrong with me. It's not that I'm not a real grown up. I don't need to change. I just need to find a different way. And there are many ways to achieve our aims. And so I think we're all much better off thinking this didn't work. I'm going to try something else as, as my way to do it rather than trying to jam myself into someone else's mold. Because we all might take different paths 
to get to the top of the mountain, but we can all get there in our own way. And so there is no one right way. And I think that what you're doing is so important because it lets people come to this information in their own way, in their own time. And if they need to listen to some, listen to the same thing 10 times, they can just hit, you know, repeat and then figure out how to act on it in their own way. Thank you so much for being here. No, thank you. So I feel like we could talk all day. (laughs) If you enjoyed this, Gretchen has a podcast called Happier with Gretchen Rubin that I'll link in the show notes. And I have a huge favor to ask. If you're enjoying the podcast, it would mean a lot to me if you could take a quick moment right now to leave a review of the podcast wherever you're listening to it. Even just a sentence is perfect. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with me today. I'm so excited to talk to you again next week on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me. See you there.